introduction and it's honour to be here. And uh, look, when I was speaking with uh, Nanette and Winston uh, prior to this function, they did sort of emphasise to be brief, so I'll attempt to be so. You know, common words uh, used here, and every speaker so far is the word passion, isn't it? And I believe with passion, anything is possible. With passion and belief, anything is possible. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> questions. It's, kind of, it's kind of true though, isn't it? I mean, if you are passionate about something and you believe it's possible to achieve, then you know, it's, it's, it's almost possible. you just got to get out there and have a go. And I became very passionate about a, something I heard about when I was competing at the Olympic Games. Part of the New Zealand rowing team went to the Atlanta Olympic Games and I saw a flyer that was on a notice board there and it said Atlantic Rowing Race. And this was a concept which was for two-person boats were to row across the Atlantic Ocean from Tenerife uh, just off the northwest coast of Africa, across to Barbados in the West Indies, about 3,000 miles of open ocean, or about 4,500 kilometres of open ocean. And I thought, mate, got to have a crack at this! <laughs> Made a decision. Made a decision. Now, 4,500 kilometres, it's actually, it's actually quite a long way. <laughs> and, uh, and, mate, I, I couldn't get my head around it, you know. And, and I think with any big, scary, hairy, kind of audacious goal, the first thing you need to do if you want to take the second step after you've made the decision is to bring it down into more rational, realistic, achievable sort of chunks. And I think almost trick yourself, deceive yourself even if you had to. So I was in this state of trying to get my head around this enormous ocean, first ever rowing race, and I just couldn't take the next step until uh, I saw this photo. And I realised, <laughs> actually... It's not that far. It's actually like rowing from the intestines across to the udders, you know? It's not that far. So I made the decision, ended up, uh, quit my job, I topped up the mortgage, I got a, actually got a bank loan to build a boat, built a boat, found an incredibly silly man to join me in this race, first ever rowing race for two, crews of two, and we turned up at uh, start line in Tenerife, 30 boats lined up for the adventure of a lifetime. Sunday morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, away we go into the unknown. Often asked, you know, what did you do? Four and a half thousand kilometres in a boat. Well, day one, we rode. <laughs> day two, we rode some more. Day three, we took off our clothes. And we rode, uh, with a strategically placed drink bottle, of course. <laughs> um, uh, you know, our philosophy to win this race was to keep going. If you can't walk, creep. Just keep inching towards the destination. No matter what challenges you face with, just keep moving. We did two-hour shifts, alternating. One person rowing, two on, two off, round the clock, non-stop, non-stop. If we were going to win this race, we had to do that. And we did. We won. First ever rowing race across the Atlantic. Amazing. <laughs> it was an amazing feeling. And, and um, you know, coming onto dry land, but wobbly on the feet. Lost a lot of weight, 14 kilos. Um, but it was, a, it was such a cool thing. You know, um, one of the big things, um, Prince Andrew came out from the awards, for the awards ceremony, I just showed Prince Andrew there. He um, gave us a piece of wood with a turtle on it. <laughs> and he also gave us a couple of trophies. There was, no, there was no prize money or anything like that. And it wasn't about prize money, it was about making the decision and going for it. And it wasn't necessarily about winning either. It was about overcoming the hurdles along the way. I haven't got time to go into too much detail around that. I will say, though, it was about attitude and how you overcome those challenges along the way depended on your attitude. And while I was mid-Atlantic, my brother, Kerry Hamill, was an inspiration to me about his attitude. In 1978, he had been doing his version of the overseas experience at the age of 27, sailing the seven seas. He was taking a paying charter on this particular trip from Bangkok up to, sorry, Singapore up to Bangkok. He got blown off course into Cambodian waters took shelter behind a small island about 50 kilometres off the coast of Cambodia called Koh Tang. On the other side of that island was a Khmer Rouge naval gun base. That, uh, that evening, a gunboat attacked his boat. Uh, Kerry's close friend, a Canadian, Stuart Glass, was shot and killed at that time. And Kerry and the charter, an Englishman, John Dewhurst, were taken prisoner back to Tulsling Prison in Phnom Penh, the capital, where they were tortured for two months, forced to sign confessions to being CIA and were then executed. When I was at sea, I grieved for my bro. And I realised that at some point in the future I was going to have to do something to honour the memory of Kerry. 
Pol Pot was the man responsible for the Khmer Rouge regime and came into power April 17, 1975, cleared the streets of Phnom Penh, the capital, two million people forced to, into the countryside to basically go and grow rice. Anyone was resisted, was forced, was killed. The place was a desert, left deserted. The one uh, place that remained operational was Tul Sling, the prison that my brother was incarcerated in, and it was operated by this man, Doik. Doik was uh, uh, well, infamous for creating the killing fields on the outskirts of Phnom Penh. Um, the process of going into that prison was you're brought in on a cattle truck, shackled together, blindfolded, the blindfold was removed, a number tagged to your shirt, photograph taken. It didn't matter what age you were, it didn't matter what gender you were, it didn't matter even if you're a child. When that photo was taken, uh, your fate was sealed. It didn't even matter if you were a baby or a mother for that case. Same deal. This kid would be about the same age as my eldest boy. Uh, chain around his neck, number pinned to his shirt. This kid didn't have a shirt on, so they pinned the number to his chest. Somewhere between 15 and 20, or 30,000 people went through that prison, all met the same fate. My brother just went missing. He, uh, the letters, regular letter writers, they just stopped for 16 months. We didn't hear a word, didn't know what had happened. Hope for the best, of course. Didn't ever dream or nightmare think the worst until we started reading articles in the media, would you believe, of my brother's incarceration, torture, and confession and murder. And this confession, it's an incredible document. He described, to give some sort of, he, he mixed fact with fiction. And what he did, he, he talked about his life as a child growing up in Whakatane, New Zealand. Whakatane is not a rude word, actually, I should say, just to clarify. Uh, it's WH in Māori is uh, fa, Whakatane. Are you okay to say it? It's one time. Uh, <laughs> He, uh, <laughs> he, he, uh, um, he mixed his childhood memories of growing up in Whakatane, New Zealand, with his parents, with his siblings, and translated them into training operations to being a CIA operative. My dad, of course, was a CIA instructor. Um, he, um, that document is still in the grounds today. He used incredible humour, would you believe, and irony in that document. This is Kieran's um, confession, taken under duress. And I guess this is the Khmer version. I from New Zealand, and I am the CIA. I hereby to testify have used the modern equipment of uh, Mary Mary. Ah, Mary Mary. Yeah. Mary Mary. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Mary Mary is a, um, I think it was a gas-fired power station, or maybe a coal-fired power station. He's just, you know, there's a lot of humour here, and can you believe he's try, He's just trying to have some fun. I enrolled in the Psychology for Intelligence Officers course. This was taught by an American CIA intelligence officer, Major Roos. And Roos, of course, being a, a con. A course on covers for intelligence officers was given by Colonel Sanders. Um, <laughs> which is obviously under duress, Kerry was retaining some sort of sense of humour. Amazing. He also, would you believe, managed to somehow send secret coded messages to his family that only his family could have ever understood. The public speaking course was compulsory for all the second year students. This was taught by Mr S. Tarr of the Carnegie Institute. Tarr was the head of the CIA office in Hamilton. He held the rank of captain. And Esther, of course, is my mum, Esther. Yeah, and as I said, she was a lovely speaker. And she had this lovely Irish lilt that, um, yeah, you know, it was a message to my mum. It was a message to my mum. You know, um, you know, Mary Mary couldn't have been a more ironic place to be training <laughs> to be a CIA compared to where he was living at that time. And of course, Colonel Sanders was a busy black back in the 70s, setting up a KFC empire and training my bro to be CIA. And of course, sending these messages of love and hope, you know, back to my family, to my mum, in the hope that one day they could have, he could have a laugh with them. But if not, know that he was thinking about us all at that time. Um, the big um, thing that I've learned along the way is that, you know, he took himself out of there 
while he did that. While he was writing those, that document, he was transfer. He was out of there. He was back home having a good old time, and and living the dream. Even if it was momentarily, giving him a sense of hope. And Viktor Frankl, who is a survivor from Auschwitz, Nazi Germany, observed his fellow inmates. He said that when people lost a sense of hope, they died. Even if they were if, before they were murdered. And you know, obviously, if you're murdered. No chance, but the ones who retained a sense of hope survived. And he said he's, when they lost the hope, they died often without even... And they did that through techniques of, of observing the beauty in the world that still existed somewhere outside them, where there's a ray of light through a cloud, a flower, uh, a, 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 an act of dignity by, from a guard to a prisoner, reminding them, and of course using their memories of childhood memories of their loved ones to keep that sense of possibility that still existed out there. He said, uh, Victor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, said, forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing, your freedom to choose how you respond to that situation. And in my brother's situation, he, he responded with incredible strength and courage and dignity. And you know, we get confronted things every day, <laughs> challenges that are out of our control. And we have, we have a choice how we respond to those, you know. And it could be very low-level things. Someone cuts you off at the streetlight. Um, someone, well, relatively low-level, someone burgles your house. Um, your boss tells you you're staying at, you have to stay uh, uh, you know, after work to do some work, even though you've got plans. Um, all sorts of things. It's your choice how you respond. That You can get angry. You can deny. You can stick your hands. You know, I can't hear, can't see. Um, you, can, uh, you can curse. Fuck a tiny! <laughs> Fuck a tiny, you scoop. Uh, it's WH though. Um, you know, or you can fight. And you know the results for that most of the time. Or you can take a breath, take a step back, take a step back, and look at the situation for it is, for what it is, and give a reasoned, rational, objective response. Remove the emotion where possible. And, you know, it can be, you can practice that daily, make it a habit, so that when the big things happen, it could be a life-changing result, outcome, depending how you respond to that. Um, my second eldest brother, John, uh, didn't take the response I would have hoped, our family would have hoped. Nine months after we found out the news about Kerry, uh, John, in the centre of this photo, took his life. And my parents suffered greatly. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because the first time... In 30 years, the first person to be brought to trial for the Khmer Rouge, for the genocide of Cambodia, two million people, and it was the man who ran the prison that my brother was incarcerated in, um, Doik. And I had the extraordinary privilege to be invited to testify at the War Crimes Tribunal in Cambodia, and one of two Westerners to do so, and tell him what I thought of him. And that was interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and I also took the extra step of producing a film about the, um, the genocide of Cambodia and telling my story, and my story of discovery along the way, uh, called Brother Number One. You know, it's important because this is an unknown. We, you know, if I talked to you five, six years ago before I started this project, what did you know about Adolf Hitler? I'd get a detailed, lengthy, informed answer, correct? Ask you about Pol Pot, chances are some of you wouldn't have known who he was, and maybe still true today until now. And I know that is the case in my country. You know, we, we showed the film um, in London last year, and I was on the tube station um, to go and uh, introduce it and do a Q&A afterwards, and I got talking to a young lady, and I said, you know, what do you know about Pol Pot? And she said, oh, yeah, that's that guy who won um, Britain's Got Talent contest, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, um, opera singer guy. No, no, that's Paul Potts. <laughs> He's a different ball game. <laughs> He's a different ball game altogether. He'd be welcome in my home any time. Um, but, you know, it's an important story. I, my, you imagine being my parents, having lo lost two children, and a third son says, oh, I want to row across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> and, you know, I couldn't tell mum and dad for a month preparing to do this thing, and I had to make the call, spoke to dad for a little bit, uh, spoke to mum briefly, and then we rang off. Oh, that kind of went okay. Half an hour later, phone rings, it's mum. Here we go. And you know what she said? She said, son, you go for it. 
you go for it. She said, this could be the making of you. <laughs> I don't think she thought I'd made anything at all <laughs> in my life till that point. Um, apparently the Olympics wasn't good enough for her. <laughs> but, she, but you know, wasn't that the most beautiful, courageous and, and loving gesture that a, that a parent could give their child in that circumstance? And you know, I use this photo, these are my three boys now. Um, you know, this is a metaphor for life. You've got to let your kids climb the tree. You know, our, our society is an accountability, responsibility. It's important, but we take it to extreme. Our role as parents is to give our children the skills to climb the tree, you know? But then you just got to let them go. You've got to let them go and discover the world. Hopefully catch them if they fall. You know, if, they, if you don't, then hopefully help scrape up the pieces if it doesn't kill them. But you can't. You have to let them go. It's the same for us in life. With our, you know, the people we manage the, as leaders, as co-workers, our role is to help facilitate others to upskill themselves to achieve whatever we're trying to achieve as a team. And then you've got to let them go and have a go. And if you fall over, we'll pick them up. It's so important. And, um, you know, last boat to finish the race was a mother and son across the first ever rowing race across an ocean. Talk about having a go. The mum was 53 years old, she had a birthday at sea. Our son was 23 years old. Can you imagine that, rowing the Atlantic with your mum? Uh, or with your son, <laughs> as the case may be. They spent 101 days stuck in that little boat together. <laughs> 101 days, can you imagine? And they very appropriately called their boat Carpe Diem. Translated from Latin, of course, means seize the day. And you know, if there's any seize the day thing you can do each and every day, is control how you respond to situations. It's a, it can be a life-changing situation uh, for you. And just seize the day. Have a go. Thanks so much.